If you haven't been with us before, this, uh, this workshop is uh, designed to go 35, maybe 38 weeks. And our first venture here is to go through the big book together, finding out where everything is and how it all ties together so that we can uh, be more knowledgeable in helping our sponsees in their journey through the big book. And when we have completed that, then we will go back and we will learn how to teach the steps, one step at a time. And this is uh, from the standpoint of the sponsor, but it also works very well for anybody who's new, because as you can follow along with us, you're going to learn the big book and you're going to learn the steps. And in the process, of course, you will gain a lot of knowledge about how to work with others and how to teach the steps in the big book to them. And that, of course, is what we're here for. I remind you that uh, uh, Bill Wilson wrote in uh, an article in the uh, Grapevine that the uh, primary purpose of an Alcoholics Anonymous group is the teaching and practice of the 12 steps. Now I'd like for you to put aside any idea that uh, being a teacher in AA is a dirty word. Quite the contrary, there aren't enough teachers. And what we're doing is when we teach is we are experience, uh, we are uh, sharing what we have experienced. And of course the big book is really one big teaching volume because it teaches us what the founders did to recover. It's a history. It is not philosophy. It's not somebody's opinion. It's real life. This is what they did. And they recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. Their whole thesis in writing the book was that if we were to do what they did, that we too would recover. And they were right, of course. So with that in mind, <coughs> we, uh, have reached a point where we've been studying Bill's story and his odyssey through his uh, alcoholism. And then we've recently we've gotten into the part of his story where Bill is, uh, gets into, into recovery. Now remember that Bill was uh, in, in Towns Hospital twice and the second time when he was discharged, Dr. Silkworth told him and his wife Lois that he could do nothing for Bill, that Bill was doomed, that he would die if he didn't stop drinking. It probably had as much as maybe a year to live. And he also informed them that he could do nothing for Bill, that all of his scientific and psychological learning and all the techniques that they had were ineffective. They would not work for Bill. And this had been Dr. Silkworth's experience for almost 20 years prior to that time. There were people who came into his hospital that uh, he had to give up on. He knew he couldn't help. And those helpless, hopeless alcoholics were kind of pushed off to the side. And that was important because later they became the prime source for candidates for AA as AA began, began to grow in New York. Bill was scared to death, of course. And the whole idea was that maybe he could be scared into sobriety. Well, all of us know that doesn't work. We don't stay sober on the fear of the consequences of drinking. If we did, all it would be necessary to do would be to scare us to death and then we'd stop drinking. That doesn't work, never has worked, and yet it seems to be the basis of so much of the recovery philosophy that floats around today. And somehow we can teach people how deadly alcoholism is and teach them all about uh, what it does to the body and the brain, and uh, teach them all about their feelings, teach them all about themselves, 
and then give them all these clues about why they drink and the, the triggers and stuff, it doesn't work. Never has, never will. Self-knowledge doesn't keep us sober, and fear of the consequences of drinking doesn't keep us sober. If either one of those methods would work, there'd be no reason for AA, because AA is based upon an entirely different principle, the principle being that you and I are spiritually bankrupt and we're crazy as hell, and the only way that this is going to be ameliorated is through the intervention of a higher power. So everything in the big book goes directly to that one point, that God can and will if we seek him. You got to think what that third pertinent idea means. God can and will remove from us the obsession, compulsion to drink alcohol if we but seek him. And how do we go about doing that? We work the steps. It is in the seeking of a higher power that we are relieved from the alcoholism, that is that part of alcoholism which is, is the insanity, which is the obsession and compulsion to drink. We are not relieved ever in our entire lives from whatever it is that's wrong with us physically that means that we are not like normal people and we respond, our bodies respond to alcohol abnormally and if we drink it all it sets off an allergic reaction that Dr. Silkworth calls the um, phenomenon of craving which is more powerful than we are. If we, it's very important to remember what the first step means, what it says and what we admit, that I am powerless over alcohol, which means precisely that I cannot stop drinking myself. And why in the world would anybody think that the solution would be to tell me not to drink? Nowhere in the big book does that ever said. Nowhere does it say don't drink. What it really says in so many words is find God. The solution is to put a loving God, a higher power, between us and booze. And that's what our 12 steps are designed to do. And of course it works. Millions of recoveries later, it works. So Bill is sitting there in his kitchen shortly after Armistice Day in November of 1934, sometime around the, toward the end of November 1934, he had been told that he was hopeless, helpless, he was going to die, kept him sober for a little while, and then he got drunk again. And he's sitting there in his, in his kitchen, drunk, and his wife is out working to keep body and soul together, financially. Shows up Abby, his buddy Abby. That's where all this started, the first 12-step call. And Abby had been sober two months and Abby was doing what he'd been instructed to do, which was to carry the message, because that was one of the main tenets of the Oxford Group uh, scheme of recovery, carry the message. Abby came to Bill, Bill believed Abby, he believed what he said, he knew Abby was as bad a drunk as he was, he therefore had credibility, and therefore Bill was willing to listen to him. And when he looked at Abby and he he had to say to himself, would I have it? Of course I would. Bill had come to the conclusion, and he tells us in three different places in his story, that he was whipped, that alcohol was his master, that alcohol was the devil universal and really had him. So there wasn't any question after Abby had broken through the ice that Bill came to recognize that he was powerless over alcohol. And also that it was clear, Dr. Silkworth made it abundantly clear to him that he could never safely drink alcohol again. Therefore, we saw in our last couple of meetings that Bill, in fact, worked his first step. But he had a serious problem. That serious problem was that he had been trained and taught from childhood to be quite distrustful of religion and religious people and preachers that they didn't know what they were talking about. He had no doubt that there was some higher power in the universe but he could not imagine 
that this higher power, call it God or whatever, would have anything to do with him personally. That was the problem. It was, it, it was fine to say to him, well, you gotta pray, and this is a loving God who cares about you, and Bill didn't believe it. And so something had to happen in order for Bill to move forward into his second step, because remember, the second step requires of us that we come to believe that yes, there is a power greater than ourselves, and that power is strong enough to restore us to sanity. In fact, in chapter four, we find the precise test. And the test goes something like this. Faced with a self-imposed crisis, we could no longer evade or ignore we had to fearlessly face the proposition that either God is everything or else he is nothing. God either is or is not. What was our choice to be? Now we can see from that that if we are by that time reached the conclusion and have come to believe that God is and that God is everything, then it becomes axiomatic that he is powerful enough to restore us to sanity. Not that he will, but that he can, that he has the power. And that's all the second step requires. But it's quite a leap, the segue from coming to understand the nature of a disease and admitting our powerlessness to a place of being able to honestly say, I believe that God is, and I believe that God has the power to restore me to sanity. And so what happened with Bill was that he was expressing these doubts, this feeling that it wasn't truly agnosticism or atheism by any means, but it was, a, but it was an honest doubt that there was such a thing as a God personal to him who could care about him or would care about him or that he could appeal to and expect to have any relief because he'd always been trained that you're on your own, look to science, look to mathematics, they'll give you the answers to everything. The rule of reason was paramount in his day. So Ebby had to find a way to break through this, and we find that happening on page 12. The second full paragraph, little three-liner. My friend suggested what then seemed a novel idea. He said, why don't you choose your own conception of God? Well, now this busted through something for Bill because Bill was a pretty stubborn guy. He was full of himself. He felt he was one very savvy guy, a superior person, and uh, that his ideas uh, he held dearly and he wasn't about to change them. And one of the things that he wasn't willing to accept was that somebody like Abby or anybody else was going to tell him what he's supposed to believe in. I mean, there had to be some kind of a, of a God here that these people that Abby was representing believed in. And they were going to force him to admit or to come to believe in that same God, and he went about to do that. And Abby said, whoa, wait a second, Bill. That's not the way it is at all why don't you choose your own conception of God? And Bill says, that statement hit me hard. It melted the icy intellectual mountain in whose shadow I had lived and shivered many years. Read that for being stubbornly single-minded, not open-minded, full of himself, ready to fight at the drop of a hat if anybody disagreed with him, or tried to force him to admit to or to come to believe something that he had not already predetermined. Total prejudice. And Ebby pulled the plug on that. Now this is something that we do as sponsors. This is a great line. It's a great remedy for the sponsee that you will get a lot of them, if you haven't already, who have the same doubt. How can I go past the idea of a czar of the heavens that controls everything 
and say that this all-powerful, all-knowing being is interested in me personally. It doesn't make any sense. There must be, there are billions of us on this earth and there are probably a, several billion more worlds out there in that wide universe and a whole bunch of them have beings on them. What is it that would make us think that it's rational to believe that this power would have anything to do with us personally. And so, Evie said, just choose your own conception of God. And Bill says, I stood in the sunlight at last. But there had to be more. Because at this stage then, Bill might want to choose the, his idea of a higher power, but maybe not. Because if he's still stubbornly hooked, uh, hanging to his own conception, whatever it might be, and now Abby says to him, it's only a matter, he says, of being willing to believe. In a power greater than myself, nothing more was required to make my beginning. And that statement is repeated four more times in our four step to chapter two agnostics. That's the key. All it takes is the willingness to believe that there just might be a power out there greater than myself. And this, what happens here, I guess, I can't prove this, but it seems to me logical that once the willingness is in place, we open the door enough that God's grace comes in. Bill said that he learned he had to pray just as if there were a God. And then when all the miracles started happening and everything started changing his life and he could no longer deny that these things came from a power greater than himself. He said that's when faith came and that was the greatest gift of all. Now we do know that even the most intransient sponsee, if you say to them, just as an experiment, try prayer. Pray to whom it may concern. Or God if you're there. But pray. And just see what happens. Invariably, if they do that, things do happen. And almost always, within a very short time, the gift of belief is given to them. And so now we have found, as Bill says, I thus I was convinced that God is concerned with us humans when we want him enough. Now that's a very, very powerful provisor, proviso, when we want him enough. This is, this is the burden on us, just as we just read in the three, third pertinent idea that uh, God can and will, if what? If we seek him. You see, it, it all comes back to us. It's sort of like this, if it's to be, it's up to me. I've got to do the work. I've got to come to certain beliefs and certain conclusions and certain decisions. And if I do that, then, and if I, if I truly want God in my life, You've read, some of you read chapter 7 where it's talking about this, that you can't force this stuff on anybody. If he is to seek God, the desire must come from within. And somehow or another, that comes to those of us who are chosen to be here. Many, it never comes to. Just why, I don't know. But for those who achieve the desire to find God, then we can work with them because we can show them the way to do that. He says, at long last I saw, I felt, I believed, scales of pride and prejudice fell from my eyes. See, he, he recognizes now in hindsight that what he was dealing with here was really pride and prejudice. He was closed-minded. Now, you, you, in reading the big book, you can see over and over again Bill's emphasis on open-mindedness. In fact, we made a mantra out of that. It's part of how. Honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. Not altogether sure how all that stuff fits, but open-mindedness is clearly something which must come to us in order for us to begin to have a feeling that there is a power out there interested in us. I like to say to my sponsees, if you go down to the beach, 
pick up a grain of sand, carry it away from the beach, and it will never be the same beach again. And you can put yourself in as minuscule a place as you want in this universe, but you are unique, you form a part of the universe, and you are important. We may be very tiny, but we are important. We have a place, and God cares about each and one of, every one of us, and we find that out as we go along. There had been a humble willingness to have him with me, and he came. You see, Bill is recognizing now what is happening to him as all of these changes began in his thinking, and his, he became willing to believe. And so what happened then, that he, he, he really wanted sobriety now. He was very sick. He had been, of course, he was heading up toward death. He was afraid of going back into seizures, delirium treatments. And he decided that he'd, he'd better, he had to go back to the hospital and detox. And Dr. Silkworth was glad to take him back, by the way. He really liked Bill, and they, they became really great friends. And so at the top of page 13, at the hospital I was separated from alcohol for the last time. Treatment seemed wise, for I showed signs of delirium tremens. And you knew what that was because he'd, he'd experienced them. If you haven't experienced those, I don't, I don't, uh, recommend it to anybody. That's bad stuff. I know I had three seizures and I was absolutely certain I was going to die. Now then, on page 13, this is one of the most important pages in the big book. And it's so easy, you know, for your sponsor, you just go Shh, right on by this. Oh yeah, 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 okay, well, sure, right. Without really thinking it through. What's going on here? We need to teach them. We need to know ourselves. What's happening here? Okay, remember that by the time Bill got to the hospital, he had worked his first step and he had worked his second step. So now we find him back in the hospital for the third time with Abby, his friend, there teaching him and bringing him what he had learned from the Oxford group about the steps to recovery. So let's see what happened. Second paragraph on page 13, at the hospital now. He's in his hospital bed. This is a short time. This is not a long stay. He wasn't there for months. Maybe a week and a half at most. There, he says, I humbly offered myself to God as I then understood him to do with me as he would. Well, that's the third step, isn't it? God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. So Bill's working the third step right here in the hospital. I place myself unreservedly under his care and direction. Remember the third step tells us we do this without reservations. Here he says unreservedly under his care and direction. Withholding nothing. Here I am, God, take me, use me, do with me as you will. The understanding being that if it's your will that I'd be in the outback of Australia next year running a cattle station with only aborigines for neighbors, I'll be happy as a clam at high tide because you'll have me doing what you want me to do and it'll be the right place for me. Whatever it is, I'm giving up. I placed myself unreservedly under his care and direction. I admitted for the first time that of myself I was nothing, that without him I was lost. Remember our decision of the third step, how that comes about? On page 62 in the chapter 5, we find out that our problems of our own making, that alcoholics are extreme examples of self-will run riot, that we are the authors of our own misery, that God didn't do it. We find out that we have to be rid of this selfishness or it'll kill us. And then we come to recognize as we 
contemplate that third step, that in fact we have been playing God, trying to. We have been self-directed and it didn't work. And then the big book says we had to quit playing God, it didn't work. And then the third step is right there and it just kind of sneaks up on us. The big book is so dense, we have to read every word to know what it's really telling us. It says, next we decided in this drama of life, God was going to be our director. He was the principal. We were the agent. He was the father. We were the child. That's the decision of the third step. The prayer is a beautiful prayer, and it, is, it, it, it bolsters and effectuates that decision. But the decision is made right there when we recognize, as Bill just said here in his story, I admitted for the first time that of myself I was nothing, that without him I was lost. Now then, when we have finished our third step, the big book then tells us that this is a vital and crucial step, but could have little permanent effect unless at once followed by a strenuous effort to face and be rid of the things in ourselves which have been blocking us, namely defects of character, insanity, and guilt. And here in chapter 1 on page 13, I ruthlessly faced my sins Read sins here for defects. And became willing to have my newfound friend take them away, root and branch. What steps do we see there? Well, obviously, we have the four step facing our defects and our guilt. We have the fifth step where we face them orally and admit them to another person and to God. And we have the sixth and seventh step where we ask him to remove them. So he says, I ruthlessly faced my sins and became willing to have my newfound friend take them away, root and branch. That's clearly, that last part of that sentence is clearly the sixth step, isn't it? I've not had a drink since. Now the second paragraph here, recounts that Ebby had come to, to see him, to meet with him, to teach him. My school mate visited me and I fully acquainted him with my problems and deficiencies. Pure fifth step, isn't it? What are we seeing here? We're seeing Bill working all the steps, lying in the hospital. In that week and a half while he was detoxing. Oh, but you can't do that! Huh, balderdash. <laughs> we made a list of people I'd hurt and toward whom I felt resentment. Eight step. I expressed my entire willingness to approach these individuals admitting my wrong. Eight step. Now interestingly enough, we find both of those sentences incorporated in our four step in our big book because our eight step is done in our four step. Maybe you may not remember that or haven't experienced it yet, but that's where we do our eighth step. While we're looking to see what others have done to us, we look to see what we've done to them. We find out whom we have harmed and we become willing to set matters straight if we can. Our eighth step is done almost entirely in our fourth step. I express my entire willingness to approach these individuals admitting my wrong Never was I to be critical of them, which of course is a primary provision of doing the ninth step, isn't it? I was to write all such matters to the utmost of my ability, pure ninth step. See what's happening here? It's kind of interesting, isn't it, when you take this pair, these three paragraphs and tear them apart and see what's really going on. I hope that the reading this may help some folks change their minds about when we work the steps, that there's some very serious misinformation out there, very serious. 
really the question is how soon do you want to get well? And the idea that somehow we're, our brains are too foggy to even contemplate the big book of the steps until we've been sober five years, <laughs> things like that. I mean, this is deadly. Can you imagine how many people are being pushed in front of buses every day with that kind of nonsense? You know, the truth of the matter is, you look at the people who help write the big book, you'll find that over half of them didn't have a year's sobriety. And many, many of that 100 were not six months sober. But they were already 12-step veterans by the time they were six months sober. When I came in in 19, I was going to say 1928, that was when I was born. <laughs> in 1964, the rule was that you work nine steps in 90 days or less. I was working my 11th step on my 47th day, and I was slow. I think I told you that last summer I took a man through the steps in six days who was visiting here from England. He was willing to do the work and we got it all done. And he's doing great. So now let's see what, what more Bill did. In the third, fourth full paragraph on page 13, I was to test my thinking by the new God consciousness within. Now then, if you will turn to page 85 just for a second, we'll see where this comes in, this God consciousness. By the way, everything that Bill is writing about here is simply a foretaste of what we will be learning as we go through the rest of the book. On page 85, if you'll look at the last full paragraph at the bottom of the page, and this is, this is at the time that we have begun to work the tenth step. If you look at the four lines from the bottom of that paragraph, to some extent, we have become God conscious. Before that, it tells us that we've begun to sense the flow of his spirit into us, which by the way, is what we're told in chapter four, that we're gonna find God deep down within us. It's only there that he can be found. And all these things happen, it tells us right here in this paragraph, if we have carefully followed directions. People like to hide behind this business of suggestions as if somehow that lets us off the hook. It means that there's nothing set. There's no, and they love to say there are no musts in, the, in this program. You know what that really means? It doesn't mean the big book because that would be a blatant lie. You can find 62 or 63 musts and plenty of other phrases which mean the same thing and all of them mean ultimately mean or else, must or else. That phrase comes not from the big book and does not refer to the steps at all. It refers to the traditions. And it comes from a writing that Bill uh, contributed to the uh, grapevine in 1946 in which he said that there are no musts in AA, meaning that the traditions are all framed in the sense of we ought to or we should, not that we must. And so that's a totally false premise right from the get-go. So I was to test my thinking by the new God consciousness within. I am conscious of the God within me. Probably, at least this is what I think, that God is spirit and I am spirit and he is with me and I am with him. And I've, I, and I've had some very uh, intense discussions with people who claim some sort of atheism or strict agnosticism who talk about having found their better self. And I say to them, I think what you mean is the same thing we mean. You found something strong within you. We call it God, you call it a better self. 
and maybe that's true. It certainly is a, gives room for some thought. So he goes on to say that common sense would thus become uncommon sense. Now, this presages, of course, what we're going to learn in the fourth chapter where Bill is, takes great pains to help us segue from second into the third step by teaching us about the bridge of reason and how our dependency on reason will not get us to the new land of faith. That we have to go beyond that. And that means we have to begin to take some leaps of faith. That we're not going to make it simply by relying upon reason, upon science, upon mathematics, upon mechanics, or any of the other disciplines of the world. And it says, I was to sit quietly when in doubt, asking only for direction and strength to meet my problems as he would have me. Well, that's clearly meditation, isn't it? But that, that's what meditation is here in AA. We're just, we're listening to God. We ask and then we get quiet and listen. That's all it is. We don't need any of these, these uh, directed, uh, guided meditations. We don't need fancy music playing or anything like that. We don't need crystals or symbols or some guy in a saffron robe or <laughs> om, 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 or any of that. I mean, it's nice if that's what you like to do. If you can carry your ashram around in your back pocket, that would be pretty good. But the truth of the matter is that in AA, we meditate any time of the day or night. Whenever we get jammed up, we can stop and ask God for help and they get quiet and listen to his answer. If I ask you a question and you're trying to give me a good answer to it and I turn my back and walk away before you answer me, wouldn't you think I was nuts? That's what we do with God, you know, we pray and then we don't listen. I guess we got so used to praying in, in, in the before life for things that we were demanding that God do for us that then we just decided we didn't have to listen for his answer. We just wait around until he answered our prayer. But we don't do it that way. We sit quietly when in doubt asking only for direction and strength to meet my problems as he would have me. Now, in, our, in chapter four, in the fourth step, for example, by the way, a meditation is mentioned seven times in the body of the big book, not in the steps, but not in the, in the stories, but first 164 pages. And it, it's always mentioned as something where well, you, you do it, don't you? Doesn't everybody meditate? It's never made a big deal, but it is one of the crucial elements of that simple kit of spiritual tools that the book talks about in the second chapter. And so what we're doing here is we are fulfilling the, the, the 11th step which tells us we're to <clears throat> seek to improve our conscious contact with God through prayer and meditation. Praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. See what Bill is saying here? I was to sit quietly when in doubt, asking only for direction and strength to meet my problems as he would have me. So this is pure 11th step. Never was I to pray for myself, except as my requests bore on my usefulness to others. Again, pure 11th step. Then only might I expect to receive, but that would be in great measure. So now what have we found? We found Bill working first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth steps and the eleventh step. What happened to the tenth step? Well, the Oxford group didn't have anything that even approached the tenth step. And there was a good reason for that. See, they believed that once you had worked their six steps, that you achieved a sort of a spiritual perfection and so therefore it was not necessary that after having done the first five steps it was only necessary that you go out and carry the message and you would have achieved this kind of a spiritual nirvana and our guys found out that wasn't true that isn't the way it worked with them tell you what they did find though 
They found that the world and all of its people would continue to threaten them. And they already knew by that time that threat equaled fear and fear equaled the recurrence of defects and the recurrence of uh, selfish, self-defeating and dangerous and uh, harmful actions toward others. And so what they found was that in fact they had to have a way to, to keep up with all this stuff. They had to know what was going on with them today. They had to know what their present circumstances were. Well, now how to go about doing that? A 10th step was not something anybody invented. It developed over a period of three years until the time that Bill sat down to write the big book. It had developed by trial and error, but it's all very, very logical. If I'm going to have a recurrence of my defects, if I'm going to have a recurrence of harming others, how am I going to deal with these on a daily basis? Well, I already have all the tools, don't I? I have the fourth step, the fifth step, the sixth step, seventh step, eighth and ninth steps. So what am I going to do then? I'm going to take these tools that I've already learned how to use, I'm going to put them in one step, and I'm going to call it, as Bill did finally, the tenth step. This means then that as I go through the day, if dishonesty or selfishness or resentment or fear come up, those four, only those four, I am to inventory them, continue to take personal inventory, it tells us. I'm to inventory them, four step. I'm to admit them to another human being, the fifth step. I'm to ask God to remove them, the seventh step. And if I've hurt someone, I'm to make amends quickly, the ninth step. So now what we see, we look at it and we say, well, wait a second, this was pretty smart. They took the tools they already know how to use, the fourth, fifth, sixth step, seventh step, the ninth step, put it all in one step. Said what we're going to do is as we go through the day, each day, we're going to stay current with what's happening to us and we're going to use a spiritual remedy on the spot to stay free of these things which block me from God. Remember that's what we're talking about here. That's why this stuff is so serious, because it blocks us from God. And if we're blocked from God, we have no protection and we will drink again. Remember when we did our four step, what the big book told us that these resentments were infinitely grave, that we had to be rid of them or they'd kill us. Why? Because they blocked us off from the sunlight of the spirit. Now, so you can see what happened here. By trial and error, by experience, they found out that there's no way to take the steps and not have a recurrence of defects. Not that God didn't take them away, that's, that's a foolish notion. But that they do come back because the world continues to threaten us. And it's, it takes a long time sometimes for our faith to grow strong enough that we seldom have fear but so long as we're experiencing fear, we're going to experience the recurrence of defects. And then they found that there was one more thing they had to do. They had to turn their thoughts resolutely to someone they could help. So that this 10th step not only incorporates 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, but it also bridges over to the 12th step. And then finally, to cap it all off, that, they, that love and tolerance of others was our code. This was what we were to practice. See, that doesn't mean that we are to have the undisclosed, unarticulated, uh, unacted upon uh, love. Uh, love which is, which is nothing but a state of mind is nothing. It is just the same as Faith without works is dead. Love without the action of love is dead. 
So this means that we are to actively love others, love them through our actions and tolerance of others is not a state of mind, it's being actively tolerant. Tolerance without the action of tolerance is dead. It has no value, just a bunch of electrons floating around our heads. So you see what happened here, the 10th step was nowhere on the horizon at the time Bill was in the hospital working these steps. Now, of course, you say, well, there's one great big missing step here, isn't there? Where is step 12? Aha, good question, so we're gonna find out. Bottom of page 13. My friend promised when these things were done, I would enter upon a new relationship with my creator, that I would have the elements of a way of living which answered all my problems. Now, a lot of people would like to argue about that, but this is at least big book authority for the fact that the 12 steps are the solution to all our problems. I found in my life in AA that to be literally so. And Bill makes no bones about it here, does he? Solve all my problems. Belief in the power of God, plus enough willingness, honesty, and humility to establish and maintain the new order of things were the essential requirements. Let's see what that says again. Belief in the power of God, and, and of course that belief is a, is a function of the second step, isn't it? Came to believe. Plus enough willingness, honesty, and humility to establish and maintain the new order of things. That doesn't mean a new order of society. It means a new order of things within us a new way of thinking, a cleansing of our mental cesspool, a rebirth. And the rebirth means that we are, that the spiritual malady is overcome and, and our straight, uh, thinking straightens out, thank you, thanks to God. To maintain the new order of things were the essential requirements. Now, <clears throat> Bill is not saying that we have to acquire humility and honesty immediately because the truth is that when we get to the fifth step we'll find that it is in the fifth step that we learn enough honesty and humility as is necessary in our program of recovery which of course means and I I know a bunch of people left the second night I was up here because I I made a point uh, point out that these so-called principles behind the steps are totally screwy. Honesty is, is something which comes to us as a result of the fifth step, not the first step. And humility is something that comes to us as a result of the fifth step, not the seventh step. And this is real clear. If you read the book, page 73, it's right there. So now Bill is, is telling us that these things must come. Willingness, honesty, humility. These are essential. Then he says, simple, but not easy. <laughs> it is simple, you know. When you break this program down into its essential parts, it's very, very, very simple. Nothing esoteric about it. There's nothing about it that's metaphysical. It's all straight lines, it's all straightforward. And the results are automatic. And I promise you, if the results are not automatic, we'd never make it. If we had to think and philosophize our way through all this, we'd never make it. That means the promises that follow the ninth step are the inevitable result of working the steps. Work the steps, get the promises. You want the promises, work the steps. Simple as that. What do they say? They will always materialize if we work for them. Quite clear, isn't it? The restoration to sanity, the big book tells us this has happened automatically. We didn't struggle for it. it just happened. It came because we worked the steps. What's the 12th step tell us? 
we're not going to struggle for a spiritual awakening. Spiritual awakening comes to us because, why? Because we work the steps as a result of these steps. And that's, that's the rule all the way through. Do the work, get the result. Do the work, get the result. Simple, but not easy. Matter of fact, I think you, some of you have been around here a long, long time, and you know what I'm talking about when, we, when I say that this is not a program for sissies. It takes some courage to, be, to successfully work the steps, especially that part where we have to be honest with ourselves. We have to be honest with another person, and we have to make amends to people we perhaps have been running from for years. It can be a very fearsome prospect to a newcomer, and as a sponsor, you gotta recognize that and help them get past those fears. Simple but not easy, a price had to be paid. It meant destruction of self-centeredness. That doesn't say it would be, oh golly gee whiz, kind of nice if you sort of backed off a little bit and didn't, weren't quite so self-centered as you used to be. What, does, what do we don't understand about destruction? Got to be gone. Yes, sir. Bill, um, I have a question back, uh, if you back up a uh, sure. few minutes ago. You said about the um, principles behind the steps yes. and, and honesty being on page 73 and humility. Now, when I look at the first step and I say that we admitted that we were powerless over alcohol and that our lives have become unmanageable, personally, I have to say that that takes a lot of sincerity and honesty. And if you're just fooling yourself with that, that it, you know, I, I can see honesty in step one. Now, granted, I see what the big book says about if, you're, if you haven't learned enough honesty or humility, by the time you get to the fifth step, the chances are you'll go out and drink again. I see that. Well, I think what if you if you I think what it says is that uh, we have not learned enough humility, honesty, or fearlessness as we find necessary until we've told someone else all our life story. Now, just turn that around. What it's really saying is, when you've told someone all your life story, you will have learned the honesty, humility, and fearlessness that is necessary. You just turn it backwards and that's a clear meaning, isn't it? The, the other thing, you see, uh, you and I might not be uh, on all fours here. My, my view, what I've been taught about the first step is that it is essentially a gift. And when we talk about honesty, we find honesty being something which is uh, made a big point of in first paragraph chapter five, where it tells us that we can't recover if we don't have the capacity to be honest with ourselves. But honesty with ourselves and with others is something which really is tested in the fifth step, the fourth and fifth step. Uh, the, 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 the question that you raised, it's a very good one because it's so seldom understood that the first step is not taken until we have accepted as a fact that we can never safely drink alcohol again the rest of our lives. Because if we have any lingering uh, doubt about that, or if we have, uh, we have the hope that somewhere, someday we'll be able to drink like other people, it really destroys the efficacy of the rest of the steps. And whether that connotes honesty, I guess in a sense it does, but I always thought of it as being a, an acceptance of this as a fact. And, not, and no longer fighting it. Now, I suppose too, when, when you're working, and I know you do a lot of sponsorship, so when you're working with somebody and you're asking them, have you accepted as a fact that you can never safely drink alcohol again the rest of your life? No, res no reservations. At that point, I guess we have to either accept their statement, yes, as being true or not. And maybe, in many cases, it's not true. Maybe there's still that lingering reservation, but, but there's no way we can cut their head open and find out or give them a lie detector test. So I try to make it as positive as I can that this is a sine qua non of recovery. Without this, you don't make it. And so we will hope at that point, for honesty, we will hope that the gift has been given that, and that they have come to the absolute acceptance of this, not just as a theory, but as a fact for them. 
that uh, this vain hope that they can drink again at some later date like normal people has to be smashed. So that's the way I look at it anyway. And I, I don't mean to, I'm not trying to pick on anybody, but I, but I, but it, the, 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 the principles behind the steps were propounded by those three guys in Texas and published in the grapevine. They, it's not part of a literature, it's not approved a literature, and it, and it sets up false standards because most of that stuff is not a principle at all. It's a way of being. It's a, it, or maybe a, a wonderful way to live your life or something we ought to be, but the, but the principles are the steps. And I don't see how you can have a principle behind a principle. I don't think that's logically possible. So that's why I, I make a point of it sometimes. And I don't mean to insult anybody's intelligence by that, but I, I'm glad you asked a question because I, I'm happy to have a chance to explain what my point of view is. Does that, does that answer your question? No, yeah, I think, yes, it answers my question. Good, well listen, thanks a lot for bringing that up. <laughs> Jim, Jim, I got a question. Um, yes, Tom. When, when the big book was written, wasn't it an honest desire to stay sober was the only requirement? What what is the difference between that honesty and? Well, I don't know that. See, that was taken out when when the when the traditions were written. That was in the board of the first edition. An honest desire to stop drinking, and I often wondered what would be a dishonest desire. How can you have? A desire which is dishonest. It's either desire or it isn't. So that's why when Bill got around to writing the traditions, he realized that that, was, that word was pure surplusage. It had no real meaning, so it was taken out. It's not in the traditions. It was, you find it only in the forward of the first edition. I know, but I, you know, I admitted um, I was piled of silver alcohol and that was unmanageable twice, and I drank right after that. So was I not honest, or was I just... Well, that's only that's that's one step out of twelve. That's where it all starts. Without that, you're not going to the steps are not going to work for you. So, but once you work the twelve steps and you continue to stay on a spiritual path, path through ten, eleven, and twelve, I've never seen anybody who does that who went back out. Doctor Bob agrees with that. Remember, he told us in his story, it never fails. But you got to go about it with one half the zeal used to go about getting the next drink. Which means, as the Big Book says, we have to be disciplined about it. discipline and consistent. It tells us that we do this every single day. Now, and I know for a fact in my own experience and the people I've worked with, and I know a lot of folks, people who do that don't drink. And inevitably, if somebody's been around for a while and they start drinking, the first question you want to ask them when they come back, did, did you stop working your 11th step? And inevitably they'll say yes. And, and uh, Bill wrote a whole article about that one time in the grapevine. It, it ended up in Language of the Heart where he, he, he talks about take the 11th step and he says that this, this, is, this is what happens. We know something's wrong. We're 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 hiding it. We're presenting a bright face to the to the group and to the world. Our bright-eyed friends, he say, tell us how well we're doing. And he says, but inside we know better. We're not doing well at all. And, the, and he said, the, the reason here is because we have stopped working our 11th step through prayer and meditation and inventory. We continue to grow spiritually. And this, it's so important to understand how all this stuff works together. For example, there's one sentence in the, in the third step on page 63, which is really the whole program of Alcoholics Anonymous in one sentence. It says that God, being all-powerful, will provide what we need, everything we need, if we stay close to him and perform his work well. And that, of course, includes the sobriety that we need, plus everything else we need. The, the, the joker in that deck is that we've got to do whatever is necessary to stay close to God and to perform his work well. And once having reached the point of the, of the ninth step and having been restored to sanity from there on, staying close to God is a function of the 10th, 11th, and 12th steps. And the 12th, 11th step is a step where Every night we check to see if we've gotten off the path. 
and we go through 10 questions and we ask ourselves those 10 questions every night to look back. If we've gotten off the path, we ask God for help, we ask his forgiveness, we ask him to show us how to do better. And then we pray and we meditate in that step as well. And these are highly, highly spiritual uh, actions we take, which, which will keep us growing spiritually. And that's the key because, you know, uh, a lot of you have been around a long time, you know you, can't, you cannot stand still spiritually. You cannot. We must either go forward or we'll go back. And uh, our steps give us all the tools we need to continue to grow spiritually. So if you knew, make up your mind that you're in this for the duration. And that means that you're going to be learning how not only to get sober, but how to stay sober and to grow spiritually. And it's going to be necessary for you to dedicate a certain part of each day in your life from now on to doing your spiritual work. Because that's the only thing that will work. So, here's, th this is one of the most important statements in the whole big book. And, and it is a statement which is followed to the nth degree. See, the big book is absolutely consistent internally. It's never inconsistent. And here's something which a, a sponsor has to know. Top of page 14, the second sentence in the first paragraph. I must turn, I must turn in all things to the Father of Light who presides over us all. That means all things. What don't we understand about the word all? That means that when we presume as sponsors to begin to direct our sponsees' lives from our own predilections, prejudices, and maybe some of the stuff we've learned, we get clear off base because we begin to violate this major provision that we teach our sponsees to turn in all things to the Father of Light. And when we begin to tell them that they can do this or they can't do that and setting time limits on this and time limits on that, directing their lives especially their relationship lives, we fall, run directly afoul of this very simple provision. We teach them instead to turn to God. Just as the big book tells us in chapter, in the fourth step, when we have any, any, any uh, sexual problems, the remedy is simple. It tells us in our morning meditation, we ask God what we should do about each specific matter and that the right answer will come if we want it. This is not a place for human solutions, which always are going to come out of some sort of point of view or prejudice, or maybe some false teachings, who knows. But if we're consistent, the big book always is. And if I tell my sponsee, you're going to turn in all things to the Father of Light. When I am faced with my sponsee with a problem, I say to them, write it down, take it to God, tell God you are powerless over this and you need help, and ask him what he wants you to do. And after you have said that prayer, you get quiet for a little while and listen to what he has to tell you. And the right answer will come if you want it. Because that's the truth. That's exactly what happens. So when we are consistent, we are right in line with the big book. When we are inconsistent, when we say on the one hand, you got to trust God in all things, except all this stuff over here is your sponsor, you got to trust me in all these things. All we're doing is fostering dependency and we're setting a false standard. We're putting ourselves ahead of God. And we ought not to ever do that. Okay, these were revolutionary and drastic proposals, but the moment I fully accepted them, the effect was electric. Now this paragraph really is describing Bill's epiphany, that time when he had this major um, spiritual experience. And in other writings, he gets into it far more, far deeper. But here he barely touches on it. 
There was a sense of victory followed by such a peace and serenity I had never known. There was utter confidence. I felt lifted up as though a great clean wind of a mountaintop blew through and through. God comes to men, most men gradually, but his impact on me was sudden and profound. Now what happened here, in accordance with Bill's other writings, was that he had come to this conclusion. Who was I to say there was no God? And so he prayed. And he prayed to God, if you're there. And he asked God to show himself. And it was at that time that he had this huge spiritual experience, this epiphany, which, by the way, stayed with him for the rest of his life. It's also very important to recognize what he says in this last sentence in that paragraph, that God comes to most men gradually. What don't we understand about that? Does that say that the sine qua non of recovery is to have an epiphany? No, it says just the opposite. How can anybody misunderstand that? How can anybody feel that they can't recover unless they have a bright light burning bush experience? It's quite clear here, isn't it, that the impact on Bill was sudden and profound. Now, in light of that, you want to read very carefully what that says in that piece of stuff in the back end, end of the book called Appendix 2. Because Appendix 2 is based upon this false concept that everybody who reads this book is going to be confused about that. This is only the first time. There are four more times in this book where it tells us that the sudden spiritual experience is very rare and that for most people it is a learning experience. It is something that comes to us gradually over time as we experience God working in our lives. That the spiritual experiences accumulate and eventuate to a spiritual awakening. And so we, we have to be very cautious of what Appendix 2 says because it reaches some very uh, unfounded conclusions, among which is that our more religious members call it God consciousness. That's a snide and scurrilous comment. Because the big book makes it quite clear that we will all experience God consciousness, not just our religious members. So we have to be a little careful about that. It's not part of the big book. It was added in the second printing of the first edition. It was not in the original big book. <laughs>